What's up, Internet? My name is Michael Cook, this is Blue Giant Media, and we're here to connect through gaming. Today, we're going to take a look at The Seventh Continent by Ludovic Rowdy and Bruno Sauter, published by Sirius Pulp. So we're going to go ahead and set this game up in real time. Don't worry, we're going to take the Voracious Goddess, which is the recommended first curse, and we're going to just go through like the first three map tiles or so. We're going to set the game up in real time so you get a feel for how to get started with the curse. It's going to be something that universally applies to all the curses. And then we're going to just discuss some of the different actions that you can take and how they're resolved. Because once you know that, you will be able to pretty much follow through on most everything else in the game from there. So, let's go ahead and ready, set, play. Alright, so The Seventh Continent is a game where you're going to be exploring the Seventh Continent. You have been mysteriously pulled back to this place which you have once visited before, and you don't know why you're there. Suddenly you just woke up there. So to set this game up, I'm going to pretty much be stepping along with what is in the rule book, but I know some people are able to learn and pick things up better by doing or seeing rather than just by reading. So you can follow along with me. Here I have all the stuff numbered from uh, 1 through 99, as well as all of the different skill cards and stuff. So in my satchel and binder, I've got, or the satchel and journal, I've got the satchel and journal card, which right here, it shows um, how many items you can hold. So right here it shows that you can have, uh, if you're in a one player game, you can have four different items, each one with four different things beneath them. And you can hold four uh, green cards and five regular cards. So it kind of lays that out for different setups. Uh, then you also have the pocket watch. This is something that's uh, used in the Path of Repentance. So it is, that's not a spoiler. This is something that is just there. You can use it anytime you want to use the Path of Repentance. That just is what I keep in there because I tend to like using it. There's also this major relic, which you can choose to start the game with. If you want easy mode, it's number 777. All right. So you can use that. Basically what it'll let you do is if you die, it lets you start over, um, kind of right where you are. So that's the stuff that is oftentimes used in just about every game. You have an action deck and a discard deck stand, which you may or may not have if you are just getting like the classic version or you've been able to get your hands on some of the replacement set of cards. Um, but these are just an optional thing, not required. But this is how you're going to be putting them together. And then you're able to put your action deck there. So I will start by just grabbing those basic skill cards. And uh, these are just the regular cards that you can start with. And you can shuffle them and put them in your action deck and set them to the side. And then I'm not gonna bother setting up the discard file, but it's gonna be set up the same way, put in the two ends and then slide in the bottom. One side of the discard pile gives one benefit that you can do when you're digging or praying. And the other one gives you the ability to do prayer whenever you see this, uh, see this on your terrain card, it gives you something that you can do. I'm not gonna let you know what those things do. I'm just gonna let you know that there is a difference between the two sides and you can go ahead and pick. All right, so now let's start setting the game up. All right, so you would read this little blurb right here uh, I recommend that you, if you have the game, that you go ahead and take a moment, pause, and read this through. It just gets you in the mood for the game. So now that you've had a chance to do that. All right. So welcome back. So we're gonna go through this setup here. Each player is going to choose a character. When you choose a character, each character of the different ones that you can choose comes with their own basic skills that you can use. So let's see, I've got there's five cards that you can put in. So if you wanted to choose this guy, you can have his five cards and you'll shuffle them in to the action deck. And we'll just go ahead and say that I'm playing a two player game. And if you're playing solo, you can still play with two players. Oops, that's the wrong card. Let's go ahead and put that one back. All right, so now we've got those two different heroes, both of their sets of five cards. There are a couple other things that you can do at the starting setup that can get added to the deck based off of 
what curse you're doing. If you are choosing the flying roots, there will be some cards that you get to put in here and you can start with in your satchel and journal. Um, there's a couple other things. You're just gonna have to read um, the sp There will be a card that you can have for the given curse, which is one of the next things we're gonna do. So we're gonna go ahead and give each player their figure and their fire. If you have standees, you can use those. Um, but I've got one fire for each. And then, let's see. This is one thing that gets me a little bit. It's a little bit hard to tell who is who. So this is the one with the stick. And this guy is, let's see. Looks like he's this one. All right. Go ahead and put that back. If you got the standees, you can use the standees. Here's these are just um, if you're using the fear of the, de the devourers or the um, flying roots, you can have these close by. But now each player has their standee, their starting card, their fire, and based off of what uh, number of players you have, and that can also be what given number of players you have that specific session, because people could be in and out. Uh, you're going to go ahead and give dice to represent how many different items that person can have. In a two-player game, each of them can have three different items, so each of them is going to get three different dice, which are not rolled. Those are just basically counters. This is also when you would grab the 777 card if you want to play easy mode, or the 650 card if you wanted to play hard mode. All right. And now is when you would choose your actual curse. You can choose as many as you want, but you're recommended to just start with um, the Voracious Goddess, which is what we are going to start with. So we'll go in here. Oops. And I'm going to grab my copy of that. There's also, you can, there's an easy mode that comes with um, expansion. You can play with easy mode cards, the flying root cards. Um, so we're going to grab the card for the Voracious Goddess and four other Death is Lurking cards. If you're playing with other um, different curses, then you can go ahead and swap out the Death is Lurking cards for their curse cards. Put those back. Or I should say you just... Um, you can always keep the four, but there could just end up being more curses. All right, so now we're gonna take those. We'll take the 35 original skill cards, the uh, five special skill cards for each player, the curses that we're going to use, and the four death is lurking cards. Plus, if you have, as I said, the flying roots or the easy mode, uh, you can go ahead and put those in as well. Nice thing about the sleeves is I can get away with a, a light shuffle. All right. And now our action deck is ready to go. Next thing we're gonna have to do is have everything sorted out. Luckily, I've already gone and done that. And you definitely want to have your stuff sorted out because it's, you're gonna be digging through there a lot. Okay. All right. Next thing we can do is we're gonna look at the curse that we're working on and you can read the flavor text and it's gonna tell you where you're going to start, which in this case it says is the number 10. So we're gonna grab card number 10. And you will always grab the green card because you can see there's a green and a yellow. You will start with the green card. All the, the yellow cards are going to be stacked behind or filed behind the greens. You only take the yellow card if you are supposed to grab specifically the yellow card or if you're supposed to grab the same numbered card and all the greens have been taken already. So we're gonna leave that yellow one there and we're just gonna take out number 10. And you want to read, I'm not gonna go ahead and read them all, but you're gonna to wanna to read the flavor text for all of these things because they do sometimes give you interesting hints as far as what you're gonna look for. After you set this card down, then you're going to want to put out exploration cards showing the number in the uh, Roman numerals here. So this has a one on them going up and to the left. So I'm gonna go ahead and randomly grab one to go up and to the left. Then we're gonna go ahead and put our characters on there. 
and spread this stuff out. Uh, like I said, I'm not gonna go ahead and read any of this, but there is a map on the front and all the different curses have different clues. This one has the map that tells you kind of where to go, kind of a rough idea. Some of the other ones just give you uh, like a scrap of someone's notebook that gives you an idea of where to go, or it's gonna give you some kind of a clue. And the reason why they recommend the Voracious Goddess first is because you're gonna go through a pretty decent amount of the continent and that knowledge that you gain by exploring through the continent is going to help you know where to look when you do other curses. So that's why they recommend that. You can then take this and you can put it in your satchel and journal binder. Okay. All right, so now having read the curse, having read that flavor text on page two of your rule book, now you're ready to actually play. So when you are ready to play, one of the things that you're gonna do most often is start exploring. So whenever you have these cards here, these are exploration cards. So in order to reveal behind the kind of fog of war, you have to kind of explore things a little bit. You have to scout things out before you actually are able to travel to that place. So if you want, you can choose, and whenever you do an action, you're supposed to choose who the active player is. So you're gonna say, all right, Elliot Pendleton, he's the one who's gonna take this, he's going to be the one who's taking this action. If you have multiple players, you can take it together, but one person has to be designated as the main player in that situation. So we're gonna go ahead and say Elliot Pendleton is the main doer of this action. And we can say that he wants to look this way. So we're gonna flip that card over and then you're gonna leave it in place. So this says that your calf is itching uncomfortably. Basically, you, it's a spider bite. So I'm not gonna read all the flavor text, but uh, it says only the active player is forced to take the following action. And he's forced because there's this uh, symbol right here. When it's outlined in red, that means that you have to do that action. So this has a zero plus in the blue diamond, and then it has a two star. That means that you need two successes, and you can draw zero or more cards, and you have to get at least two stars. So in this case, I have to decide whether I want to do that thing. Um, the, if I succeed, it says that the wound heals nicely. If I don't, it says eggs under your skin, certainly not possible. And you're gonna banish this card. When you banish, that card is removed from the game. And there might be things that refer to how many things have been banished or things like that in the, in the future. So, you know, it removes it from the game, but is that a good thing or not? You don't know. If it's in the bottom part, that's probably not a good thing. So you might want to decide to try and counteract that. So the basic thing for doing any action and this kind of gives you a rundown of what you would call each of the different actions. And there's different resources and action consequences and all that kind of stuff. But whenever you're doing an action, um, the blue diamond tells you how many you must take. The plus means that you may take more from your action deck. And then the star tells you how many stars you're gonna need to get. So in this case, I might decide that I want to draw three the other thing that you can do is you can look in the rule book and on page, let's see, where is it? Page 13, there's this table that shows you if you want to get three success or two successes, that's what we're trying to go for. If I have two cards, I'll get a 45% chance. If I have three cards, I'm gonna have a 75% chance. So you can use that chart on page 13 to help know roughly how many things you might want to draw. So here, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over three because I wanna make sure that I get to survive this. All right, so I have one, two, three stars. These halves are both of the same half, so I can't combine them. I would have to have a card that has a half a star on this side to be able to put them together. So since I can only construct three stars, three stars, but all I needed was two. So I'll take this and there is a space for banishing cards. I'm gonna go ahead, I keep mine just back here in the back of the deck. Okay. Now, whenever you take an action, the player involved can choose one of the cards that was taken and put it into their uh, inventory. So I could take this blowpipe, this raft, this camouflage outfit. They all, get, all are going to be able to do different things for me. So let's just say, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and take this blowpipe and I'm gonna put it in my 
hand, which would be you know face down. Um, then this will go into the discard pile, which as I said, you can construct it. Now that I have explored, I get to reveal and it says here 009 on the left side of this card. So I'll go over and I will grab the 009 card and then place it there. Again, you can read the back. So I'll place it there. And don't be alarmed, sometimes there's gonna be cards that have multiple numbers or multiple copies of it. Just grab one of them. They might do different things, but either one of them is a valid choice. But you don't get to choose one and then say, oh, never mind, I wanna look at the other. Just choose one. As soon as you reveal this, if it has any spaces for exploration, you'll go ahead and grab exploration cards and put them there. To move, you'll look in the bottom left of your card. And to move is something that you can do together or you could do separately. Um, let's, for example, say that this person wants to move by themselves. So they have to get, turn over one card at least, but they don't need to get any um, stars. They're just gonna turn over a card. So I'll turn it over. And like I said, you can, whenever you take an action, you can choose one of the cards and keep it. So then he'll go here. So now we get to illustrate something. And that is on each of your cards, you're gonna see down here, it says that if you are moving to a terrain card where there is another explorer or a fire, then you get to reduce the, the action cost by one. So I could then take this guy, he could do whatever he wants over here, and then for free, because he gets to remove it, uh, reduce it by one, he can move over to join him. Then let's say they want to, you get to look on the card, and it's gonna show different things you can do. I could, if I want, I could investigate here, and it doesn't cost anything, but I'll turn over a 13, but you never know, maybe it's good or bad. There's these kind of like, jets here maybe I might hurt myself but maybe I'll discover something I can go look over here it's gonna cost a card which the cards basically represent your stamina so you don't necessarily want to burn through them too fast um, and there's all these kinds of things so now let's look maybe we want to decide to make this club so when you have these items after you've uh, after they're in your hand this part here no longer matters so you don't have to worry about the stars there but up here it shows how to actually build or construct that card so, uh, sorry. So here it says it's gonna take three cards, but I get to reduce it by different amounts based off of what resources I have at my disposal. Here, you can see in the bottom right corner, there is a picture of the kind of the stone. So I can reduce it by one because I have access to that stone. So instead of doing three, I only have to do two. Now the other thing you can do is if you choose to do an action together, you can reduce the cost but for every one that you, in for, that you reduce the cost, you increase the, um, what you need to get as far as successes. So I could say, hey, we're gonna do this together and we're gonna turn, turn over just one, but we're gonna hope to get one star. That way we only have to turn over one. So we could try that and we got lucky and we survived. So, or not survived, but we succeeded. And again, either player then could take this. So maybe this player chooses to take it and we successfully made this item. So now this would leave someone's hand and it has a three on the die up here. That means it has three durability. You can use it three times. After you've used this item, you will reduce it. And after you use it again, you'll reduce it again. And after it reaches zero, you will get rid of that. Now, one thing you can do with these items, and you'll see kind of shown in the Satchel and Journal card, is a certain number of these white, you know, underneath, you, you can get multiple segments to this item. You can kind of combine items. So if I wanted, I could take this card and after I make it, paying whatever the cost is, I could just stack it under here. And then whenever I use this item, I can choose to use both portions of it if they happen to have the same um, benefit. So the benefits on them, this one, it only really can be useful when I see this action or this action. Then it will allow me to get this benefit automatically. Now the star seven, means there are some cards that have, obviously I did not shuffle this very well, some of them that have this seven here. For each star seven, that makes these sevens become a success. So that's what those do. So if I was doing an action that involved that symbol already, then I'm allowed to use that, that item. Now, when I did put this item together, this one has a keyword down at the bottom that says aggressiveness, and this one has a keyword that says vigilance. They can be strapped together, but they're not gonna be the most useful combination of things. Uh, let's see if I can find a couple items that match. So this one says stamina and stealth. 
This one says clothing and stealth. So if I was to build this item, it starts with three. And then let's say that I made this one and I wanted to put them together. Because at least one of the keywords match, I get to add the durability of the item that I just crafted to the other one. So it would up it to six. That's only if at least one of the keywords matches. So at this point, you can continue to explore crafting items, uh, deciding what you want to investigate. The other thing you're going to do is you're going to take this right here or just use your eyes and you're going to be trying to zoom in on some of these because sometimes there's going to be hidden numbers. There'll be numbers that are, and I don't want to show you any of them, but there's going to be some spots where you'll see a number kind of like faintly written in there. It, they're not like super duper crazy well hidden, but you have to actually look to see most of them. Uh, if you do see that number, then you're gonna go ahead and look for the card with that number in there, and that card will have a number in the bottom corner. So if I did see something on this one, I'd look for that numbered card, and if it has 010 in the bottom corner here, that with a thumbs up, that means, yep, you it comes from that card, and you would replace it with that card. Other things to be cognizant of, when you see this kind of gray card with the black arrow to the green, that's telling you that you're gonna replace the white gray exploration card with a green card. If you see the green card with a red arrow to the gold, that means that you're going to, red arrow, red arrow means banish, you are going to get rid of that card forever and replace it with the gold card. So that's another way that you can end up getting the gold card. You will also see um, some a lot of the other things that you're gonna run across will tell you what to do when you come across them. Uh, there are going to be some actions with the lock symbol on them. When that happens, you can't choose to draw more than the, the number it says there. You can't change how many cards you draw unless you're using an item that will allow you to do it. Because it must draw the exact sum, number of cards unless they choose to apply card effects from the hands and or inventories. And if you see this kind of, um, stairway symbol that means that it must be taken together because it's going to take you somewhere else and you can't be completely on different islands and this action right here little circle slash that means that you can't make a fire craft or rest on that spot so maybe it's like because you're crossing a, a some difficult terrain crossing a chasm or something like that you're not going to stop there and or you're climbing a cliff or whatever so other than that like i said most things are going to tell you what to happen and the main things that you're going to look out for is you will know when you win because the card that you pull says so and usually you're going to know that you lose because the card says so um, most of the time you're just going to follow what the cards say other than that um, one of the most common or most easily explained ways that you can lose is after you run out of all of your action cards then you're going to take these shuffle them and put them well i guess you start drawing and then you put them in the discard pile and you would start drawing from the discard pile to do things. And if you turned over a curse card from the discard pile, game over. Um, so you, there are ways to get these things back into your action deck. I will not tell you what they are, but you will discover those as you go along. One other thing to be aware of is when you move, you do not have to draw just one space. If you have a whole bunch of things revealed, like if I was on this space, and this was revealed when you, when you move you can move to any space that you have revealed so you can go all right i'm going to pay the movement cost and it's for the card that i'm on but then i would move as far as i can through revealed spaces so it isn't pay to move here then pay to move here then pay to move here it gets done in i'm paying to move and i move as far as i want to within all of my revealed cards and so the last thing i want to show you is going to be how to save the game so to save the game you're going to take everything from the map other than the tile or card that you were on and that's going to go into the past now you can choose to put everything back now or just at another time if you want to make it really quick you can just keep it in the past and go ahead and put it in there then we're going to take these save cards all right, so this is gonna be the discard pile. So under that is where you take the cards that are in your discard pile. Put that there. You put this on top of the action deck and save those cards to let you know which ones are gonna be the action deck. Then you're going to take each player's 
um, character card and put behind them all the cards that are in their hand. All right, so one card in hand. Then you're going to take the item. So let's say you know, this one was a, a six and this one was still a three. So what I do is I take this card and you can see I can turn it over so that there's a six on top. So I'll take that. That reminds me that that particular item has six durability left. And this one, I put it so the three is up and put that behind him. So there I've got these two characters and the card that they are on, the action deck, the discard pile, and the leftover uh, cards that aren't being used for the items. And then you just go ahead and stick that in your safe slot. If I can <laughs> get it to behave for me. There we go. And there it is. That way when you pull the cards out, you're able to know where you are, you're able to know what was in each person's hand, and what items you had, and what durability they were, and then what, how much uh, cards were in the action deck in the discard pile, and then you're ready to go. Now you know how to set up and play through a little bit of The Seventh Continent by Bruno Sauter and Ludovic Rowdy, published by Sirius Pulp. If you want to know more about The Seventh Continent, take a look in the description section where you can find a link to my unboxings, as well as my overall thoughts on The Seventh Continent, and you can also find a link to macronovagames.com where you may or may not still be able to find some parts of The Seventh Continent and its expansions available for resale. Until next time, I want to thank you so much for watching. Please let me know in the comments section below if you have any feedback for me, recommendations, requests or corrections, and also please like, share, and subscribe if you like what you see, and as always, have a wonderful day.